Good morning. Let's stand together and let's praise the Lord today. We're so glad you're here today. Isn't it great to be in the house of God? Amen. Amen. Let's begin to praise God for all of his amazing grace today. Sing with me. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Amen. Who shakes the whole earth with a holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace, amen. This is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. So oh, you lay down your life, that I would be set free. And oh, Jesus, I see for all that you've done for me. Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of Glory, the King of the Kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. Thank you, Lord. Let's worship him today. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Oh, worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Oh, worthy is the King who conquered. Let's sing that again. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Oh, worthy is the King who conquered the grave. And worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. So lay down your life. That I would be. Free. And oh, Jesus, I see for all that you've done for me. All right, you guys can have a seat. Thank you very much. Can we just lift our hands again to the Lord? We did that last week and just say, thank you, Jesus. Just say, thank you, Jesus. Even though we're not fully back and hugging one another, that's coming. That's coming, right? Hope you guys have had a great start to your week. This is Sunday. This is our start to our new week. We thank the Lord. I thank the Lord for seeing you guys here. Uh, at least I can see some of you here, not all the way to the back. And we are trying to do everything we can to keep you safe and, and keep you 
in the Spirit. We want to walk in the Spirit. We've been talking about that. So we're just delighted that you're here. If you would just lift up your voice to the Lord in, in silent prayer, we're not going to have a grab and hug one another right now. But just ask the Lord to help us in the climate that we're in right now. And remember that we of all people should be the most receiving and accepting of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Isn't that right? Can I get an amen out of that? Yeah, there should be not a hint of any rejection of anyone we should love as as Jesus loved us. So I welcome you. Thank you for being here. Let's worship the Lord together. I want to draw your attention this morning as we've come together to worship from, from Psalms 34. And probably many of you know this psalm. You've got many of it memorized. It's going to sound familiar to you. But I want this to really sink into us, especially given all the things that are going on just this last week. I'm going to have to go back to weeks before or the last several months. Just think about just this last week, okay? And in Psalms 34, it says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord, and the humble shall hear it and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Amen? Amen. Amen. David writes, he said, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. Amen. If you need some deliverance from fear today, let me tell you, Jesus is here. Amen. Amen. He said, they looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man, David talking about himself, he said, this poor man cried out and the Lord heard him. And save me out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps all around those who fear him and delivers them. Verse 8, one we all know. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And blessed is the man whose trust is in him. In him. Would you pray with me? Father, Lord, I pray that in our lives, Lord, that this, this scripture right here, Father would absolutely be a testament of our lives. Lord, that your praise will never cease to not come out of our mouths. Lord, that in the rough times, we'll be praising you. In the great times, we're going to be praising you. No matter what we go through, whatever we feel like, Lord, we're going to be praising you. Because you're the only one that can answer us in the middle of our fear, in the middle of our trouble, in the middle of whatever else is going on. Lord, you are the one. Lord, you hear us when we pray. Lord, today I pray for every one of us, Lord, that we would be able to taste today and see that you are good. See it with our eyes, Father. And Lord, literally, it's so sweet it would just taste it. You can just taste it. So, Lord, I pray for that for us. Lord, I pray the same thing over our nation, Lord. Lord, that today our nation would taste and see that the Lord is good. Lord, and bless is the man who puts his trust in him. Father, we trust you today, and we thank you for it in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Would you stand back up for just a couple of moments, and let's begin now to do what we just read about. And let's let the praises of God ring in this place, in your heart. And let's just worship Him today. Amen. Let's sing together. And oh Lord my God, in you I put my trust. Yes. And oh Lord my God, in you I put my hope. Let's say that again. Oh Lord my God, oh Lord my God. In you I put my trust. Yes, I do, Lord. And oh, Lord, my God, in you I put my hope. Oh, in you, in you I find my peace. Lord, in you, in you I find my strength. I lived 
up holy hands and sing, let the praise
Today in Psalms 37, Lord, I've never once seen your children begging for bread. Lord, you've always been a provider. You've always been a helper. You've always been faithful. No matter the storms of life, the victories, the mountains or the valleys. God, you've been the constant in all things. So Lord, we just love you today. We thank you. We rejoice because of your great goodness towards us. Lord, we bless you and praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Would you stand with us one more time?
pastor's going to come in just a minute but let's just again put our focus upon the Lord God I look to you I won't be today, Lord, for all of us in every, whatever season of life we're in right now, Father, that we look to you for your wisdom. And Father, now we want to hear from your word. 
So Holy Spirit, Lord, speak to us. Lord, share with us the wisdom of God. Lord, that all of us would have a heart and minds and ears open, ready to receive what you have for us, Father. We thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You Amen. may be seated. Amen. Let's give this team a thank you for all leading us in worship today. Is that not right? Thank you, Lucas, for uh, introducing our graduates. And I remember that's kind of a great feeling, isn't it, ladies, to know you're done? Yeah, I remember that feeling well. And you know, I was thinking that it may be a good thing that we didn't have all the graduation, we didn't have all the parties that we have. I remember mine, I was not a believer then. And a lot of people get hurt, you know, just celebrating and stuff like that. So maybe God just protected us from some of that craziness. And another thing I meant to tell you when we were gathering for our welcome time is that Agape, Agape is worshiping today with us. This is their first day back. So let's pray for them, thank the Lord for them. They're right behind us on the second floor in room 289, and they're worshiping the Lord in Spanish. So we believe that verse that says, one day around the throne, every tribe and tongue and people and nation will be gathered be before the Lord, and they will be praising him. Whatever language we speak, there's 7,000 plus in our world right now. We're going to understand what's going on before the throne and before Jesus, our Savior. We're going to continue today looking at the, the topic, what happened to Jesus happened to you. And we started that about eight weeks ago, and I'm going to be, keep talking about it. We've still got a few more weeks to go, and we're looking at the second part, what happened to Jesus happened to you, ascended with Christ. So last week we began that. This part of what happened to Christ happened to you is deeper truth. We need the song that we just sang, the wisdom of God, vision to see, all of the things that God has done for us and in us and he's doing through us. We need him in this message. So you know that when Jesus was crucified on that cross, you were crucified with him, co-crucifixion. I am crucified with Christ. You know that when he was buried, you were buried with him, buried with Christ in baptism. When he was raised from the dead, you were raised with him, raised to walk in newness of life. Now we're looking at this. When he ascended, you ascended with him. And when he sat at the right hand of God, that means that everything the Father had done through him and everything he had done to accomplish the Father's will was now complete. And what did he do? He sat down. He sat down at the right hand of God. And the Bible says, we're going to read it, that we sat down with him. You really need to begin your life sitting before you begin your life running or walking, correct? We have a grandbaby and we get the pictures and we love him, you know, and he is learning to sit up. You know, he's a little wobbly and you have to put him in one of those chairs, but he doesn't start by walking or running, does he? He starts by sitting. And so what you may need to do today is you may need to just sit and let Jesus work through you. Instead of you being overwhelmed as we sang in that song and trying to figure it all out, you may just need to sit in his lap and say, God, you work in me both to will and to do of your good pleasure. You work through me. That's what we're going to look at today. What happened to Jesus happen to you. We only celebrate Easter once a year or the resurrection, but the effects of Easter are still going on. And let me just stop for a minute. If you are on version, it's the Bible app. Uh, you will have my notes in front of you. You will also have discussion questions that will help you. So if you can do two things at one time, listen and also check out your uh, version. go ahead and do that. He lives his life Listen to this, through you. It's not you trying hard. It's you letting him do what only he can do. Sometimes you don't even know that he's at work. You know, some, I watch this worship team and I know that they're 
using the talents and the gifts that God has given them, but I also know that God is working through them. I love to hear them sing. I love to see them worship because I know that God is working in them. The Bible says in that song that we sang from the book of Psalms that he's our rock, he's our foundation, but he's also my shield. And those shields were wraparound shields. So there's nothing that can touch you. You are hidden with Christ and God. We talked about that last week. You're seated with him at the right hand of God, far above all principality and power. What could possibly harm you? The Bible says the Lord will perfect that which concerns you. His mercy endures forever. He will not forsake the work of his own hands. You are the work of his own hands. And that phrase that says, he will perfect that which concerns me. I looked up that verse, you know, I love languages and things like that. And I said, okay, Lord, what is that? Well, it was kind of, you know, anticlimactic. It's a preposition. Well, I, I don't even know what a preposition is. I had to look that up. You graduates, could I bring you up here and you would explain what a preposition is? Yeah, no, no, no. What in the world did you learn there in Broken Arrow? Well, it means what's... In this context, he's my shield. He's what concerns me above, below, on my right, on my left, all around me. Everything that touches you, graduates, touches the heart of God. The Bible says you are the apple of his eye, the pupil literally of his eye. He's got his eye on you. And if his eye is on the sparrow, what? Guess what? I know that he's looking after me. We're going to look at a phrase. Open your Bible to the book of Ephesians with me. It appears only in the book of Ephesians, and it appears four times, this phrase, heavenly places, or in heavenly places. And we're going to start, not with chapter 1, it's in chapter 1, verse 20, but we're going to start with chapter 2 of the book of Ephesians. And we're just going to read a few verses, beginning in verse 4. So find that. And then we're going to look at chapter 3, then chapter 6, and go back to chapter 1. Chapter 2, verse 4. This is really an amazing verse. Let's dive in. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Why did he do that? Boy, I really, verse 7, I wish I knew more about it to just preach on that. Look at what it says. That in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Boy, we got to pray. This is really great news for you today. Father, help me to speak clearly as I ought to speak. We know that we need revelation from you in order to understand everything that's happened to us because of what happened to you. So Lord, we thank you that we're seated with you. Make that clearer to us. Let us, as we heard earlier read, I sought the Lord and he heard me and he delivered me from all my fears. You're our rock, you're our shield, you're our fortress, you're our high tower. You're everything that we need for this new week. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at those verses that we just read with me. God is rich in what? Mercy. How rich is God? <laughs> how, how rich is he? I thought about how we measure wealth and every once in a while I'm looking on social media and it shows how much the owner of Amazon has, you know, and it's just, it's just incredible how much money. But God is rich in other things. He's rich in mercy. So can his mercy run out on you? No, there's no way his mercy can run out. The Bible says he has exceeding riches in those verses that we read. Look in your Bible. And his exceeding riches are in his grace to us. The Bible says that God is love, but he gives us grace. And his riches never run out. So you don't have to worry that, 
oh no, God gave a bunch of grace to my friend, but he ran out for me. Absolutely not. He's rich. He's exceedingly rich in grace and in his kindness. Well, that's something that's missing in our world today. And by the way, that's a fruit of the Spirit. That's a fruit of the Spirit. That's what God is like. And notice where that is poured out. Notice, look in your Bible. He made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ. I don't know if you've ever noticed that phrase before, but that is where your life is right now, in heavenly places. In the heavenlies, literally, the word places is not even in the text, the Greek. It just means you're up there with him. So what could possibly touch you this week? You cannot be touched. I shared with you last week, the Bible says in 1 John, the wicked one cannot touch you. You can read that in 1 John. The wicked one touches you not. He may be able to touch the body like he did with Job or like he did with all the saints. We suffer in the body. But he can't touch you. He can't hurt you. Your life is hidden with Christ and God and you're seated with them at the right hand of the Father. You're seated with Him. Look with me at Ephesians chapter 3. We're just going to walk through. These won't come up on the screen. We're just going to use our Bible. You need your Bible. You need your Bible. All right, look at verse number 8 of chapter 3. Now Paul says he's the least of all the saints. Let's read it. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Verse 8, verse 9. And to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in Christ, hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Verse 10. To the intent, the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers, and here it is again, in heavenly places. Now in the verse we just read, and in the previous verse, it talks about in the ages to come. That's the word eons, in the eons and eons of time. Okay, it also means everlasting. It means what's coming for us. Now, this stuff is, should make you super excited about what's to come especially if you're grinding through the life that we're in right now. An eon, according to astronomers, is a billion years. A billion years. So in the eons to come, we can't even measure that, what a billion years would be. There's no time in heaven. There are no clocks. There's no things buzzing or going off. I kind of get where I hate my phone to go off, you know, so I put it on silent and then it buzzes in my pocket or I get my secretary at home, you know who she is, and I say, would you take my calls, please? And she doesn't like it any more than I do. But in heaven, there's none of those. There's no reminders. There's no uh, voicemails. There's no emails. There's no none of that. In the, look at it again in your Bible. That in the, that it, the mystery that's been hidden for ages, for eons of time in God, who created all things, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, now look where it's being made known to the, <laughs> to, these are the angels, if you will. These are the rulers, the authorities. These are all those created beings that don't understand what's going on in the church and they're looking in and saying, what is this great plan that God has? We know because we've been born again. Angels can't be born again. Rulers, the word that we get our word archaeology from, the very first of God's created order. We are way above all of that. I don't even know that I can get excited enough or jump around up here enough to drive this point home. We've got to have God reveal it to us. He's got to show it to us where you are. I don't have the ability to do that. Let's look again at, the, at another place where this is. This is the most familiar to you. This is in Ephesians chapter 6, 
verse number 12. Okay, you know this verse. And I want you to underline in your Bible every time the word I highlighted them in my notes in purple. Because where you're seated is in glory with the King of Kings. For we do not wrestle, this is verse 12 only, against, underline that verse, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against, underline that word, the rulers, the archi, the first, the biggest, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Wow! In the heavenly places, you have more authority and power that you could possibly dispense, and it's delegated authority. It's because of your position in Christ. Now, if you get this in your head, if I get this in my head, and your position with Christ, and we capture this, we grasp this, then our condition will be different on earth. That's why we looked at Colossians, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you died and your life is what? Hidden with Christ in God. This is unbelievable truth that we don't talk about very often because, and it has been for me, it's deep, but it's true of you right now. That means that the weakest or the seemingly weakest saint has more power at their disposal than they could possibly imagine. The demons are afraid of you. Remember in the book of Acts, I'd like to preach a mini message where Paul was casting out demons and the seven sons of Sceva, Jewish exorcists, said, we command you in the name of the Jesus that Paul preaches, come out. And that one guy jumped on seven and they ran out naked and bleeding. And the demon said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? I don't know you. You're recognized in hell right now because of your faith in Jesus Christ. The demons always knew who Jesus was. We know who you are, they said, the Holy One of God. And he always said, shut up or shut up and come out of them. They tremble in fear of you because you know the Lord and you are seated with him. So it's delegated authority. Notice that first part of that verse. Your battle and wrestling is close combat. It's not a gun or an arrow. Now, they didn't have guns back then. It's not a spear. It's close wrestling. It's not with your husband, your wife, your co-worker, with anybody on the street. It's not with the bad guys or the good guys. It is with these unseen forces that are trembling because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. And we have participated with him. They are terrified. They said, Jesus, don't send us to the abyss before the appointed time. Send us into the swine. You remember the story? They are terrified because they know their judgment and their doom is sure. They're defeated foes that take advantage of us because we don't recognize the awesome power that we have because of Jesus. Now let's go back to chapter 1. Now we're going to read the biggest part of our message today. The other was not appetizer. This is full meal. This is main course. Look in chapter number 1 and beginning with verse 15. This is again where that phrase, heavenly places, is mentioned. And this is where we pray for spiritual wisdom. The Bible says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. What was his prayer? Verse 17, That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. You see that? Underline that in your Bible. The way you grow is by knowing Jesus better and better. The eyes of your understanding, your translation may have heart, being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, 
Three things, the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness, look at this, verse 19, what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? And where did this power come from? According to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand, and here it is again, in the heavenly places. Let's stop there just for a minute. Now, this is what he's saying there. He's saying that there was a tremendous amount of power exerted when Jesus was raised from the dead. Now, there's no power on earth that can cause that to happen. You can go and, and holler at someone that has died. You can go to the casket, and I'm saying this reverently or with respect to someone that's lost a loved one. You cannot cause by your own power that person to get up from the dead. And Jesus was the first one that was literally raised body, soul, from the dead. That was the explosive power that was exhibited in raising him up and then taking him to the right hand of the, the Father. And we're going to talk next week about gifts. I was hoping, students, that we would talk about spiritual gifts because you can use your spiritual gifts as you minister in whatever job the Lord leads you to go to. Because Jesus went all the way through all the powers and the principalities and the rulers and all those authorities, he went through all of that to the right hand of the Father. That is tremendous power, explosive power. Nothing like that exists in the earth, not even in a lightsaber. You know, watch Star Wars again, really like, you know, the good triumphing over evil. There's no power on the other end of the spectrum. Satan's power has been broken. He has been defeated and a spectacle has been made of him through Jesus' crucifixion on the cross. He is a defeated foe. And don't listen to that voice that says, well, you can't do anything about that. And don't look at the other side of that and say that you can just command this and command that and command this and just kind of walk through life insulated from the problems and the pressures of life. You can't rebuke your way through everything, but also you can use the name of Jesus. He said that. He said that to his followers. So we have more than we could possibly imagine. I want you to look, though, at some practical things in this. I want you to look at verse number 16, first of all. He talks about prayer. And here's what Paul says. He says, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. I take that to mean, or remembering you, some translations say, in your prayers. He was praying constantly. If you read the other letters, he says it in Romans. He says it in Colossians. He says it in almost every letter. I'm praying for you. And then he lists all those names that we can't pronounce, right? All those names that are different. You can do the same thing with your brothers and sisters in Christ. I would really like it if you don't cease to pray for me, your pastor. And you would really like it too if I didn't cease to pray for you and to give thanks for you. You know, it's really hard to thank God for somebody that you're mad at, <laughs> right? I'm going to mess with you a little bit. Or that you're unforgiving toward. And I thought about this prior to seeing any of you guys today. I just thought, if we really thank the Lord for people by name, yes, by name, this is a prayer list. How many of you forget names of people? I do that. Yeah, it's, you got to say their name. If you say their name over and over and over in prayer without ceasing, you're going to remember their name. People love names. God calls us by name. Names are important, not so-and-so. It always embarrasses me when you know me and then I can't remember your name or I say, you know, the wrong name. I slip. So pray for people by name. Paul was moved to pray for people because he heard about their faith. They came to know the Lord and it moved him to pray for them. We should pray for the pain and the hurt of other people right now. We should do that. We should just take a moment 
physically and mentally and emotionally, whatever they're going through. So let's just take a minute. You mention those people by name and let's pray together and then I'll close this in just a moment. Just a, a minute or two, let's pray. Father, hear us. By name. Thank the Lord for that person that you're mad at. It'll change. And Lord, we do pray. I'm, I have a name in my heart, Lord, that I'm lifting up to you right now. Hear our prayers, Lord. Hear our prayers. We give thanks to you for those that know you as their Savior, especially those that are with us right now, but all of your followers. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Look at these two simple prayer requests. Giving thanks, verse 16. Everybody can do that. And making mention of the person by name. I have prayer lists on my note file, my re reminder file in my phone. By the days. This is what I found to be very helpful. I have a Monday prayer list, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, a Friday, a Saturday, and a Sunday. My Sunday prayer list went off at 7 o'clock this morning. And I pray for th those requests. By name. By name. And I thank the Lord for them. You can do that too. Don't pray the all-state prayer. You know what the all-state prayer is? Lord, thank you for everybody, bless everybody, heal everybody, save everybody, in Jesus' name, amen. That is not a biblical prayer. If you think you can pray for the entire world and pray for everybody on the world by just saying, God, just take care of everybody, in Jesus' name, amen, you're like I am sometimes. You're just a lazy prayer person. You're just lazy. If you take some time this week to just Mention and give thanks for people by name, it will revolutionize your prayer life. So there's two simple requests. Look at the three profound requests. They're simple, but they're profound. Verse 17, read it in your Bible to, to know Christ more fully. So you're praying for them that they would come to know Christ more fully. You know him as Savior, and you that are listening right now, if you don't know him, Jesus will reveal himself to you. He did that on the cross, his love. You need to repent of your sins, put your trust in him, and you come to know him for the first time. You're born again. Then the goal is to get to know him more fully, more and more and more. Look at it again in your Bible. Chapter 1, verse 17, that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Secondly, that your eyes would be opened. You pray that my eyes would be opened so that I could see because if you want a better message, you need a better preacher. If you want a better preacher, you got to pray for a better preacher, Right? So if you got a bad message and a bad preacher, you've, you're a bad prayer person. All right? As Mr. Miyagi said, no such thing as bad student, only bad teacher. Right? No such thing as bad preacher, only bad prayer. Right? I can do that too. All right? And sometimes I get lazy, you know. Lord, you know what my prayer list, have you ever done that? Lord, you know what my prayer list is. I don't have time. Rub-a-dub-dub, -dub, I gotta go. You know, that, that, that just doesn't work. You're praying intelligently that their eyes would be open. That means the heart sees what cannot be seen under a microscope or through a telescope. It can only be seen by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then number three, to know his resurrection power. Verse 19, to know experience that resurrection power that lifted Jesus out of the tomb and took him to the right hand of the Father. And then you know what happened. Ten days later, the Holy Spirit came. We already looked at that. Ten days later, the Holy Spirit came. So you need, here's the second word, not only prayer, but you need revelation. You need the revelation of the Spirit. Paul says that, but notice what Jesus said prior to the cross. 
I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. Look at this second part of that verse. He will not speak on his own authority. Did you know the Holy Spirit only says what brings glory to Jesus? Whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He still does that. You need revelation. He will glorify me, that is Jesus speaking, for he will take what is mine and he will disclose it to you, declare it to you, reveal it to you. This is an unbelievable prayer of Jesus. In other words, the Holy Spirit is really your teacher, not me. I'm just trying my best to make known truths that are so deep that I don't even fully understand them. I don't really fully understand this, but I want it, you know? I want it. I want more. You can ask God for all of this, and he'll never hold back. But there's another word. Let's look at it real quickly. Power. Power. In verses 19 and 21, there are almost every word for power that is used in the New Testament. And I can't really tell you what verse they're in because the NIV flips it and uses power for might and then the ESV uses some other word for it for authority. So here are the words. I'm just going to list them. They're in verses 19 and 21. The first one I know is in verse 19. It's the explosive resurrection power. That That word explosive comes from the word dunamis, which means dynamite in English. This is a power that just blew the doors off that grave, that rolled the stone away. Nothing could hold Jesus in the grave. This is the explosive power. In verse 19, I know that this this word is in there. It's the word power under control of an omnipotent God. This is the word used in Ephesians are in uh, the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5.22, the fruit of the Spirit is temperance or self-control. That blew my mind. I said, Lord, what do you mean power under control? We can't control your power. And he said, if I really released my power fully, the whole universe, and it's going to happen one day, is going to burn with fervent heat. All the elements are going to burn and the heavens are going to roll up like a scroll. There's still more people in your family and mine. You're one, the 52 that we want to see come to know the Lord, that don't know him yet. Yeah, it's great for us we go to heaven. But this power that God showed through Jesus and that he showed when he raised him from the dead is not the full extent of his power. It's power under control. And then verse 19, might. I don't know what your, ver- your version says. And then... Also in verse 19, strength. In verse 21, rule. That's that word that we talked about, that you're ruling and reigning with him. That word ruler or the top of all. And then the word exousia, which I love the word translated authority. You also have that. All of these things are part and parcel And then the last word is lordship. Lordship in verse 21. All of these words, I can't even figure out what they are in your translation of the Bible. But they're all there. All there in what Jesus did for us. They're sometimes interchangeable. They're sometimes interchangeable. Everything we need to accomplish the will of God is available to us. You lack nothing. You are complete in him. Paul said, I'm the least and less than all the saints. And if he said that, where do I fit into this scheme of things? Where do we fit in? But he said that in humility because he knew that God had raised him up to do what he did and reveal what he revealed to him. So this resurrection power is resident within you because of what Jesus did for you. You lack nothing. So sometimes I blaspheme God when I say, I can't when he can. And sometimes I don't understand when I say, I can when I can't. 
So the correct invitation is, Lord, I can't, but you can. Remember the video that we saw? I can do all things, what did they say? Through Christ who gives me strength. He's the one that is doing the work through you. So sometimes we come forward and say, I recommit, I'll do it, I can, I can, I can, and I will. And he says, you can and you won't. But when we come and say, God, you can and you will, then we're putting our trust in him. There's a really a fine line there. There's nothing impossible. With God, all things are possible. Remember the riches of his glory, the riches of his mercy, the riches of his grace to you. We haven't talked about his sovereignty in this message. Let's pray together as we get ready for our invitation. Hey, thank you for joining us today. We are so glad that you chose to worship with us. And we pray that you have sensed God's presence in this service and that he has spoken to you through his word. No matter where you're at in your relationship with God, we want you to know that he loves you. Maybe you're in a growing relationship with him and that is awesome. But maybe today you have been away from God and you really sense him drawing you back to himself. Maybe today you're ready to begin that relationship with him. Will you pray with me today? Father God, we believe that Jesus is your son and that he came to take our sin away. Lord, we trust you. What Jesus did is enough for us. So we ask you to forgive us of our sin, come into our lives and begin to change us. We ask that in Jesus' name, amen. We would love to hear about your decision today. So if you'd click the Help and Hope button right here on this page, or simply email us at eastwood at eastwoodtulsa.org. We're gonna pray with you, and we're gonna partner with you in this journey as you become all that God has created you to be. Once again, God bless you, and thank you for joining us.